ask you to sit around the side here. Noting that I am going to be carrying that way. <laughs> and if you feel like you have to pull any of those benches back to get in the shade, you may. Oh, I know. Okay. Well, like I said, guys, if you want to you pull that back, have at it. It's not that heavy. But then again, I lift heavy things all day. Just mm. right up. All right, perfect. Wonderful. Now, folks, uh, if it's all right with you, I think I'm at a good social distance here. Do you mind if I pull my mask down so I don't have to Elmer fud my way? Thank you very much. <laughs> now, uh, you just talked to uh, Sergeant Frazier over there. Uh, you can see he's a perfect example of a provincial soldier, but you may have seen some of the, uh, the red coats, the regulars milling around here. But as you can tell, do you think that I'm a British regular? Yeah. No, exactly doubtful, sir. Why? Uh, well, I only got one red part on, right? Sure. Exactly. So yes, there are a few different subtypes of regulars and provincial soldiers, and I am one of those subtypes. Uh, I'm a specialist, however. I am a ranger. Uh, now, when I say the word ranger, it probably brings to mind two things. Uh, if you're thinking the Power Rangers, you're wrong. Uh, but if you're thinking U.S. Army Rangers, anyone have that pop into their head? That's exactly what you should be thinking of. Uh, I'm basically the 18th century equivalent of them. Um, now, Rangers were a fairly small part of the Provincials. Well, keep in mind the Provincials were actually a much larger force than the British regulars who were garrisoned here at this fort. Uh, this fort only held about 450 to about 550 if you were pushing it, especially during the 1757 siege. Uh, outside, however, uh, anyone here been to Million Dollar Beach before? Okay, I saw somebody raise their hands. If you've been, or if you've been to Battlefield Park behind uh, the, the beach, that entire area was actually clear cut and made into a military bivouac, uh, which held some 1,200 to 1,500 uh, provincials, rangers, and Native American allies. Uh, so most of the force was actually kept outside the fort, quite interestingly. But it wouldn't be uncommon to see a ranger poke their head uh, here. As a matter of fact, we were responsible for building that well over there. Now, uh, obviously, as I said, I am dressed a little bit differently than the British regulars, and there's a very good reason for that. So uh, let's break it down, of course. Now, on my head, I have a scotch bonnet. Uh, anyone here a fan of Outlander? Nobody? I know there's at least one, though. But... Uh, uh, this is very typical uh, in the 18th century, especially uh, people of uh, Scots or Scott Irish or Scots Irish descent. Um, most of the Rangers, interestingly, were, were uh, Ulster Scots, either from the lowlands of uh, Scotland, uh, the western part where all the islands are, or Northern Ireland. Um, interestingly, these people settle in Boston, and if you know anything about how Protestants always hate other Protestants, when they land in Boston, most of these people are Presbyterian. And the Bostonians basically would go, we don't want these Presbyterians here, so what do they do? They kick them out to the frontier in New Hampshire and uh, northern Massachusetts and Maine. Uh, so these people, obviously, in order to survive, had to learn trades that were conducive to living in the wilderness. So hunting, trapping, fishing, uh, beaver hunting, again, was very popular, as uh, Sergeant may have told you. Um, so these people were perfectly suited to kind of fall into the scouting regiment uh, that uh, the British regulars were trying to make as a uh, specialist force, so to speak. Uh, so yes, that explains the bonnet. Uh, this uh, bandana around my neck is actually also Scottish, although it's medieval colors, gold and red and medieval Scottish colors. Remember by this point, the uh, cross of St. Andrew, which is the uh, white X over the blue field, would have been used. Actually, that's the back of the Union Jack, believe it or not. Uh, now, also, my uh, waistcoat, also called a vest in modern vernacular. Uh, this is a little bit different. Uh, it's blue with red on the inside. Actually, this would probably have been nicked off a provincial, believe it or not. A uh, provincial uh, regiment like the uh, New Jersey Blues or maybe one of the Massachusetts regiments or one of the ones from Connecticut all wore the same colors. Uh, Ranger also could be seen wearing brown or green. Remember, of course, if you are a scout, you kind of want to blend in with the environment a bit, right? Uh, the interesting thing about the waistcoat, though, uh, if you look at Sergeant Frazier's over there, you can kind of, uh, even though he's sitting down at the table, you can see that the tails of his waistcoat go almost halfway down his leg. Uh, mine are right at my waist, and there's a very good reason for that. Now, folks, I told you that the rangers are basically scouts, so why do you think, also having like looked at the environment around the lake, do you think I would want to have short tails on my waistcoat? It's a pretty obvious answer, actually, if you think about it. But anyone? Well, if you think about it, if I'm ranging out in the woods, what's going to snag on this? 
trees, underbrush, stuff like that. If I'm being pursued by hostile Native Americans, I don't want this to snag on something. That is exactly why the rangers cut their tails short. That is actually very important. I do have red breeches. Again, red would uh, not be a very common color amongst the rangers, but it wouldn't be beyond the realm of impossibility to see a ranger wearing red breeches. But again, usually uh, brown or green. These are made of wool, though, and they are quite hot in the summertime, let me tell you. Now, the thing that I get the most questions about are these. Does anyone know what these are called, actually? You can buy them at EMS now, though they're waterproof. Sounds like that uh, big uh, reptile that lives in the bayous. Gators, yes, they're gators. Uh, they're not uh, leg warmers. I'm not dressing because I look, want to look like somebody from Flashdance. Uh, these are done in the native style, however. Um, the woodland Native Americans as far south as the Carolinas, as far north as Nova Scotia, would uh, typically be seen wearing something like this. And uh, if anyone here has seen Last of the Mohicans before, anyone? Nope. Interesting. Okay. Uh, but if you watch it, Daniel Day-Lewis actually wears a leather pair of these that are very similar. So they could be made out of different types of material. Again, in this case, they're made out of wool and dyed blue, a very common color for the rangers. And, of course, I have these really cool uh, garters or gator belts, uh, which are made to look like uh, wampum, which would have also been very common for a ranger to wear at the time. Uh, also, in terms of the shoes that I'm wearing, if I was out in the field, I would usually wear uh, soft-soled leather moccasins, again, uh, to silence the Falls if I was uh, running through the brush, of course. Uh, but in a parade ground like this, uh, where we have this lovely horse gravel, uh, probably would be wearing boots. Remember, if I was wearing soft-soled moccasins, I would basically wear holes in them before the afternoon was out, and that's no good. So boots were also very commonly worn by the rangers. But you guys don't really give a crap about the clothing, right? You give a crap about the weapons. <laughs> so let's talk about those. Now, this is, uh, does anyone know what this is called? And don't say a gun, because that's obviously the most the most apparent thing it is. Uh, but it does have a specific type of name. Anyone know what it's called? Yeah, there we go. A lot of people say a rifle, but remember, rifles have rifling. This is smooth board. That's why we call it a musket. Now, this musket is about uh, 46 inches long. The barrel is, that is. Uh, a ranger would usually saw off about 8 inches of the barrel, give or take. So it was about 38 inches long. Again, you didn't want it snagged on the underbrush. Uh, one of the other things that I want to note is if you notice uh, my belt here, I do have an awful lot of melee weapons. Rangers normally wouldn't carry this. Does anyone know what this part is called? It starts with a B. Bayonet. Bayonet, exactly. And the reason is, if you think about this logically, if I'm uh, doing scouting missions in the woods and I put this on the end, I've just added, what, another 11 inches, 12 inches to this? No good. It would get snagged. Not commonly worn by the ranger, but I'm doing this just to show you guys what it would have looked like. However, I do have two other weapons that I would have had. Uh, this one especially, does anyone know what this is called? And be careful, you'd think it's a tomahawk, but believe it or not, it's just a plain old hatchet. Uh, there is a difference between a hatchet and a tomahawk. Now the tomahawks that were made in the 18th century had one single purpose, and that was basically to, uh, sorry folks, split another human skull open. Uh, the blade, if you ever look at the axe blade style tomahawks, are actually a bit narrower than this. Uh, if you don't believe that you can uh, uh, do much with them, that's correct, uh, I'll even kill people because uh, go to Walmart and buy those cheap sawed tomahawks, uh, try cutting down a tree with it. It's pretty difficult with that narrow blade. This blade is much wider. This thing has multi-functionality. That's why it's so useful. Uh, I also have on this end and uh, this end right here, uh, what does it look like? A hammer. A hammer, and that's exactly what it's used for. Now, I did have a young man who said, well, can't you kill somebody with a hammer? And I said, well, sure, but you know, you can also use it as a hammer. Uh, and as a matter of fact, to that end, I also have this little notch here. What do you think that's for, folks? Yeah, for pulling out nails. So this is a very useful tool, especially uh, considering that you know they built this fort in 44 days with men working 16-hour shifts. This would be a very useful tool to have. Or if I had to build a boat in a pinch, uh, also very useful. So multifunctionality is always good uh, if you're in a ranger company. Now on my other side, you guys can see this, but uh, you guys probably didn't. I have this. Now folks, what do you suppose this would be used for? And uh, don't say killing people, because obviously that's what it's for. Uh, but it has another purpose, a more specific and grisly purpose. Anyone know how the Native Americans took their trophies? Hmm. No, no, that, that was way more and more, but that's what the Spartans did with their thumbs. <laughs> no, in this case, it's just used for scalping. Yes, this is a scalping knife. Now, scalping was a practice that was done by both the French and the British during the French and Indian War. Uh, though people tend to think it's a Native practice, believe it or not, it actually... Uh, evolved in parallel both in the old new world and the new world. Uh, not exactly simultaneously, uh, but it did evolve in both areas. Uh, we do have more ancient sources, of course, in the old world that talk about the practice of scalping. 
Uh, for example, and again, we've done our due diligence on this because it is a bit of a controversial topic. Um, the Scythians, who are kind of a Central Asian uh, horse people, uh, used to take scalps, uh, and so did the Dahomey women in Africa, the closest to actual Amazons you would ever get. Uh, why did they take scalps? Well, these were basically a head-hunting people, uh, which means you would collect heads as trophies. However, if you think about this logically, folks, if you're a headhunter and you want to put about 16 heads on your belt, uh, you're going to throw your back out pretty easily. Uh, the stink, I can't even imagine what that would be like. So they just reduced it down to the top of the head, and that was the trophy. Uh, the Native Americans, it's believed that that practice evolved for the same reasons, but then again, we only have oral traditions rather than written ones, so we can only speculate. I will say this much, though. The monetization or the payment for scalps, yeah, that's a purely European uh, practice. So as a ranger, I would be offered about five pounds sterling at the beginning of the war for any enemy scalps that I uh, turned into my officers, uh, but at the end, it went up to as high as 20. Uh, William Shirley, who was actually the uh, provincial governor of Massachusetts, offered as much as 40 pounds sterling. Now, I know you guys are kind of scratching your heads and going, well, I don't know what that converts to in uh, modern currency. Well, don't worry, I've done it for you. 40 pounds sterling, folks, is about $9,108 US as of today. So you can make quite a profit if you're uh, collecting scalps. Uh, Shirley also offered uh, 20 pounds sterling for any scalps of uh, women or children of the enemy that you turned in. So again, uh, based on these practices, do you think that the Rangers are going to be well liked by the British regulars? No, we don't fight in their style. Uh, we hit hard, we get out fast. As a matter of fact, uh, Montcalm will describe the style of fighting as la guerre sauvage. Does anyone speak French? Does anyone want to take a guess as to what that means? Savage warfare. Yes, exactly, sir. Savage warfare. Guerre meaning war and savage is also where we get guerrilla warfare. So yes, the officers were completely disgusted at the way the Rangers fought. As a matter of fact, General Wolfe, the uh, victor of the Battle of the Plains of Abraham up in Quebec, will say that the uh, Rangers were one of the most reprehensible units in the entire universe, and it would be better that the army would be rid of them altogether. As a matter of fact, four uh, commanders-in-chief of uh, the British forces in North America will come and go before one gives credit to the Rangers for what they're worth. Uh, if you've ever heard of Robert Rogers, or Rogers Rock, that's actually what it's named after, he's one of the most famous Rangers ever. Uh, wrote his 28 Rules for Ranging, which are actually still used today by the U.S. Army. Uh, but interestingly, uh, it was a young officer named Viscount Augustus Howe who would take interest in him. Now, if you know your Rev War history, uh, you'll know that William Howe is the guy who uh, basically sat off New York Harbor with some 32,000 men uh, waiting to invade up the Hudson. Uh, this was his older brother, as a matter of fact. And uh, Howe was so impressed with the style of ranging in terms of the efficacy of it in woodland warfare uh, that he called for an uh, overhaul of all of the British regular forces to rangerify them, basically to cut their coattails short, uh, to reduce the tricorn hats down so they didn't catch on the brim and stuff like that. But of course, do you think that he made enough headway with this to do anything, really? No, and as a matter of fact, uh, during the uh, Siege of Carry On, or Ticonderoga in 1758, Rogers is right next to him. Uh, Howe has his unit of rangerified uh, regulars, and they charge up the hill, and Howe gets shot in the chest and dies immediately. So this is why it kind of stalls right there and there. But with all that being said, you guys want to see me fire this off, yes? So let's walk through the process of doing that, all right, shall we? Now, we already know this is a musket, folks. Uh, does anyone know what type of musket it is based on this firing mechanism here? It starts with an F. Flintlock, yes, I was going to say it's a flintlock musket. Good, sir, good, gold star. Now, let's see if you can get even more specific. The British had one type, the French had another. This is the British type, of course. Does anyone know what this is specifically called, this model? It's okay if you don't. You might have heard this before. It's called the Brown Bess. Why is it called the Brown Bess? Well, a lot of you look at the stock and go, well, it's brown. Well, yes, that's true. But as a matter of fact, uh, the reason it was called the Brown Bess is because the barrel or the tube that we're using 18th century vernacular was actually acid wash, so it turned, turned kind of a brown color. Now, some people attribute the name Bess uh, as a nickname for Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, back in the day, they started using arquebusiers, which were matchlock guns, uh, and they believe they nicknamed it after her, but Bess, um, actually in the middle of the 18th century, was a term that would be used for, well, how do I say this, folks? A lady of the night. So yeah, the Brits were a bit tongue-in-cheek in naming their weapons, as you can see. Now, the first thing that I have to do in terms of firing this, and I like to walk through this using a series of modern idioms. So, if we're 
looking at the components, we have the lock, the or sorry, the lock, the stock, and the barrel. barrel. So lock, stock, and barrel. That's our first idiom. Now the first thing that I do after I cradle it like this, so it's nice and balanced, and I freed up my right hand, is I pull the hammer back to half cock position. This exposes the pan um, so that I can actually fill it with powder. Now what I'm going to do today is I'm going to use this modernized uh, cartridge. This is not what the cartridges actually looked like, and I'll show you what one looked like in just a moment. But I would open this up. Now, if I was using a real cartridge, I would actually bite it open with my teeth. As a matter of fact, one of the qualifications for joining the British regulars was, take a guess, folks, what did you have to have? Teeth, but only two of them, one on the top, one on the bottom, opposed to each other. Uh, you couldn't have one over here and one over here. You weren't gonna gum that thing open, folks. So we take a little bit of the powder, we put it in the pan. And now we have arrived at our second and third idiom ways that this thing could misfire. Again, the gun is in the half-cocked position. I don't want my gun to go off half-cocked. Also, now I'm going to close my frizzen cap because I put my powder in the pan. The frizzen's the thing that the uh, flint will actually strike against. But again, another way this could go off is I could have a flash in the pan, which means that I forgot to reload or put my uh, shot and uh, wadding down the tube. And that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. Now, I'm going to take the rest of this powder charge. I'm gonna dump it down the barrel really hard, right folks? Now also I do wanna point out something. The cartridges that I would be using uh, would normally be in a nice little belly box, which would have uh, about 18 holes in it with all those pre-packed cartridges for me. Now as a Ranger, I actually wouldn't have that. I would have what I have right here, uh, which is a nice little pouch with a, does anyone know what this call is called actually? A powder horn, yes. Uh, now there are some advantages and disadvantages to having a powder horn versus a cartridge. The nice thing about the cartridge is it's pre-filled, so I don't basically have to uh, count out or uh, measure my shot, you know, the amount of powder that I'm putting in, so to speak. It's done for me. Uh, so the gun will actually fire consistently. But when I have a powder horn, of course, I have to eyeball it. So I could put in easily too much or too little, and that might cause a misfire. The advantage of the powder horn, however, waterproof. So if I'm on scouting missions and going through a swamp or a river, uh, my powder doesn't get wet. And it's very important, as you probably already know, to keep your powder dry. Now. Uh, in this case, I'm going to put down uh, my fiber wadding. I'm not actually going to put a ball down here. Cuomo kind of you know, uh, frowns upon firing live rounds. Uh, but I do have a little joke for you go uh, guys. Uh, why uh, why is a regular called a regular? He gets his daily dose of fiber. It's a good joke, guys. Get it? Now, I do want to know <laughs> one other thing here, folks. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie The Patriot or maybe the Sharp series with Sean Bean before? Uh, you might see in that them taking the musket ball in their mouth and... <laughs> spitting it down the barrel. Uh, that wasn't done, and uh, there's a very good reason for that. This is what an actual cartridge would look like. So you can, as you can see, the top of the paper here is actually folded. That's the part I would bite open. But my powder and my wadding is here, and the ball is there. So in order to get the ball in my mouth, I would essentially just have to uh, shove that whole thing in my mouth. Uh, when I fire this off, though, the barrel does get quite hot. And now, assuming that I was spitting the uh, ball down the barrel, uh, I would have uh, wadding, uh, the musket ball and the powder in my mouth. Uh, you seen how this could go wrong, folks? Yeah. yeah, it wasn't done. I would basically blow off the lower part of my jaw if I did that. Now again, uh, if I was a ranger, just a note on reloading, I would probably do a tap reload. It's really hard. Ready? Here's how you do it. That's it. Again, you want to compress the powder down if you want this to fire consistently. So a tap reload had a higher chance of the gun misfiring. In this case, I'm going to use this tool, which is called a fan of super troopers. Ramrod. Oh, yeah, I heard ramrod over there. Yes, that's usually what does it for people. It's a ramrod. So I'm just going to let the rammer go down. I'm going to pack that down. Now, guys, I want to note, I am going slowly so you can see every step of this process, but I would be given up to 20 or 25 commands in terms of uh, getting this thing ready to fire. Uh, but in terms of firing this, uh, I'm just going to reduce it down to, to three. Uh, in this case, the three commands are going to be make ready, at which point I will shoulder this weapon and pull it to full cock. It's then ready to fire. The second command will be to present. Now, why do we say present rather than aim? Well, this thing's a bit inaccurate, folks. Just to give you an idea, even though this gun went into service in 1722 and was retired in 1838, had a 116-year-long lifespan, pretty beefy, uh, it was quite inaccurate. In 1811, as a matter of fact, uh, the British government finally decides that they actually need to test the accuracy of this thing. So they line up a bunch of targets, like a typical European-style field uh, battle, and they have the men take pot shots off of, uh, at it. Now, note that uh, the maximum range of this is about 350 yards before the penetrating power of the bullet drops to the point where it's just going to leave a nasty bruise and not actually go through the flesh. 
Uh, does anyone want to take a guess, though, as to what the accuracy in terms of percentage of the shots hit was at 100 yards? Take a wild guess, folks. 5%. Oh, what? everyone's lowballing today. It's, it was higher than that. I was just saying, 100 yards, if it was only 5%, this would be a garbage weapon. 25. You're getting a little bit closer. It was actually closer, my friend, to 50%. It was 53% at 100 yards. But at 300 yards, 23%. So not a very accurate weapon. That's why we say present. Now the last command, folks, is the most obvious. Say it with me. Fire. fire. Or in this case, if we're using 18th century vernacular, it's give fire. Sergeant, would you like to give me the command, sir? I guess. Love the enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> Come on, let's go up to the northeast bastion. <laughs>